Okay, let's get started. If you have a quiz, please turn it in. Does anyone have a not turned in quiz? You should hurry up because everyone wants to see a solution. So hurry up, turn your quiz in soon. Uh, but before we go over the solutions to that, uh, are there uh, entirely my bad on the second question? I did mention how to access characters in a string uh, in class, but it was more of an offhand comment. And I saw that it wasn't in the slide, so I figured to be fair to everyone and to give a nice Christmas in late September present, uh, full points on that one. If you wrote anything on that question at all, you get full points. Uh, uh, any questions on assignment four? Because I know there was one. Yeah. The for, for the a one plus a two, yeah. So what what you can do is well, what are the what is the range of values of say a one? What are the allowed values of a one to be? Well, what's the lowest it could be? It says positive integer. So what's the lowest it could be? One. So you start a loop at one. What is the largest you're guaranteed a solution to exist be? A thousand. So you have a, say, for loop that, because you know how many times at most this is going to run, say a1 is equal to one, and you loop until it's, uh, uh, while it's less than or equal to 1,000, and add one every single time. Okay? Uh, then inside that, you have a loop for a2, then you have one for a3, it's very similarly, then a4, and then one for c. Uh, if you do that, uh, there's absolutely no problem whatsoever. Uh, that will get full points on that question. Uh, it, but the thing is, now you need to explain optimizations. I think there was a, yeah. It, it, in, if you did it straightforward like that with no optimizations whatsoever, it does not matter. Be, because if you do all uh, possibilities, you're going to loop over them at some point in a different order possibly. But if you have optimizations, then there could be uh, some dependency here. So let's actually think of one, and I'm going to give a huge hint on this one for this optimization. So uh, let's make this bigger. Oops. Oh, that shortcut doesn't work anymore. Oh, so it shifts this. Okay. Okay, great. So we have uh, a1 equals 1 to 1,000. Uh, uh, then we have a2's loop in here. Then a3's loop. I'm not going to repeat it all. And then c's loop. Well, then what are we checking inside here? Yeah, so if a1 to the n plus a2 to the n plus a3 to the n plus a4 to the n equals c to the n. If that is true, then what do we do? And please don't take pictures because this is uh, copyrighted uh, material. Well, ASU copyrighted, I guess. Um, but if I uh, do this, uh, let's just say we do the check. Then, uh, then we, of course, are going to, I'm going to do pseudocode here, uh, print uh, counter example and then since we printed one if we're not doing the bonus we're just gonna exit zero be or, or return zero if you're still in main function okay uh, no issue there but consider this so let's actually write out C's loop so C equals 1 to 1000 and then we do the check right there well uh, yeah, go ahead go ahead Uh, break will only exit, uh, get out of this loop, and it'll continue the loop on the out, the next outer loop. But but if you want to print only one counterexample, there's no reason to keep going, right? Yeah. It's just how do you check for the second break, whether you braked in the first one? So if you broke out of the first one, 
then the break that you encounter there, uh, you're going to encounter no matter what if you finish the loop normally or you broke out of it early. So you'd have to keep track of, did you exit the loop early by doing the break earlier? Then if so, then you have to do a break here. But uh, it, so it's a little more complicated. Yeah, but it's just, uh, you don't want to break uh, if you finished a loop successfully. Or, yeah, so you have to actually keep track of that. But anyway, uh, let's, let's say we do the check, that's no issue. Well, let's say that, uh, uh, for example, that a1 to the n plus dot 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 plus a4 to the n is less than c to the n on this iteration of c, okay? So let's say that... It, uh, uh, for this iteration of C, A1 to A4 are not going to change as I'm going through the C loop because the C loop's on the inner loop. So let's say that this is true. If this is true, what should I do? Well, if I increase C, is this, uh, is, is this going to remain uh, true? Yeah, because if I keep increasing C, the left-hand side's not going to change, but the right side is going to keep going up. So if this is true, what should I do? I should get out of the C loop because do I, do I need to check the other values of C? No, I, I don't need to check them because if I check all the other ones, I'm going to uh, still have this be true and it's not going to be equal. So, so then if we have here that this is true, I see you coming in here. Uh, so if this is true, what should I do? What? Oh, well, if this is true, what should I do with respect to the C loop? I should just get out of it because there's no reason to check any higher value of C once that is true. So then I just break. So now, uh, for example, if uh, we have one on all the iterations of A1, A2, A3, A4, once I get to C equals 2, then let's see. 1 to the 5 plus 1 to the 5 plus 1 to the 5 plus 1 to the 5 is 4. But 2 to the 5 is 32, which is larger than 4. Should I check C equals 3? If all the other ones are 1? No, there's no point in checking that. So I just skipped 999 iterations of this loop. By just uh, for one iteration. So this could dramatically speed up your program. So thinking about this type of thing. So if we have this type of, of loop so far, then what values of C do I need to check? Well, uh, consider this. Uh, consider the hint I gave before, where you have, say, A1 is equal to 5, A2 is equal to 6. Let's say we check that case already. Do I need to check the case where the values are flipped, where A1 is 6 and A2 is 5? No, because, because addition can be done in any order. So thinking about that type of thing, can I remove that case, is what will make this program faster. Another hint, uh, am I giving enough? So suppose that A1 is uh, odd, A2 is even, a3 is even, and A4 is also even. So the only odd one on the left side is A1. What value should I check for C? Only the odd ones, right? Should I ever check an even value of C in this case? If uh, A1 is odd and A2, 3, 4 are all even? Well, an odd number raised to the fifth power is what? Odd plus an even number, plus an even number, plus an even number, I think odd plus a bunch of evens is odd. So should I ever check an even value of C? No. So in fact, by thinking about that, I've cut the number of iterations in half. Okay? So think about that type of thing. Also, you can also think about, do I really need to go to 1,000 here? Or what is the maximum possible value for A1, A2, A3, A4? So uh, think about that type of thing. Okay, any questions about optimization stuff? And there's one for the compiler too, yeah. I guess the space that I like to have A2, A3, A4, 
No, no, uh, I'm just saying, I'm doing this as pseudocode. I'm not writing the entire loop out. It's, uh, I'm just saying a similar loop for A2, A3, and A4. Uh, uh, not, not exactly the same, uh, because like A2 equals one to a thousand. But uh, of course it depends on how you access things. But it's just a similar loop like this. Very similar to something like this. Okay, any other, yeah. No, uh, but the thing is, your program will literally take a day to run. Because if you think about it, uh, if you, I just implemented this naively, no optimizations at all. Uh, a thousand iterations times a thousand times a thousand times a thousand times a thousand is 10 to the 10, which is 10 billion iterations. Which is not really that much, but depending, well, think about that. In each one of these, I'm gonna have to do either a POW or a multiply every time, so I may have a whole bunch of iterations that I'm doing, so it could, in my experience from what students have told me, it could take a day, a literal day to run, but uh, it really depends, yeah. Yeah, so here, yeah. Well, if we have greater than, should, since I'm accessing seeds in increasing order, at some point, it could be that C to the end is equal to this. I don't know, necessarily. But if I had it like this, then once that is true, then if I increase C even more, this will still remain true. And I'll never be equal. Yes, yeah, so because of the way I'm accessing it. If I, for instance, I could very well to, uh, do this instead. Uh, if I just decrease C, and then what would I have to do to this comparison? Uh, greater than. So it, it depends on the way it's done. So I don't know who asked it, but the question about like, does it matter which order you do these? If I put the C loop on the outside, then I can't break out of the C loop this time. So uh, the order, if you're doing optimizations, matter. If you're not, then it actually doesn't matter. Yeah. So uh, what is this in that sentence? Uh, well, if you, if you don't uh, become more specific, I can't give a real world answer. I still don't know what this is. A, a general optimization or this problem? A general optimization. So I have a program running on my computer at home right now. Can anyone guess how long it's been running? So I've been running it for the past three weeks straight with all possible optimizations uh, that I could ever conceive on. If I didn't put optimizations in, then how long do you think it would run? My estimate is around five months. And it's only halfway done right now. Uh, I'll report to you when it's actually done. But uh, yeah, so it's churning and computing and trying to uh, pick the best set of values for the problem I'm trying to solve. So general optimization can really speed up your programs. For instance, um, for some applications, if you turn these optimizations on with either with the compiler or thinking about your algorithm differently, the compiler could optimize all of that code away and just do a single statement at the very end. Uh, but without optimizations, the compiler can't really do anything about that. Um, but for this problem, uh, through some uh, computations on my end, I've actually disproved several uh, conjectures in my area by doing something like this, by just iterating over all possible uh, candidates and then showing that none of them work. And then uh, this assignment is actually uh, a published paper back in the 1960s. Someone, uh, they were wondering whether this is true or not and they wanted, they were able to show via a computer at the time that there is a, in fact a counterexample. So, I'm showing you that with only not very much effort relatively, you can actually disprove uh, mathematical conjectures, which is a very important thing to uh, 
computer science in general. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you know whether your program is stuck in infinite loop or like still executes? Is there like a way to estimate how long it's going to take? Great question. Uh, so I'm going to give you the snarky answer, and I'm going to give you the uh, more realistic answer. So the snarky answer is you can never tell. It's literally impossible. It's not like I can go to Google and ask them how to do it. No one can do it. It's proved impossible to do. But the more realistic answer is looking through your program and trying to analyze what's going on. So, uh, for instance, if I uh, print the loop iteration, and then I see, oh, I put instead of less than or equal to a thousand, I put uh, or, or whatever. I did uh, instead of less than thousand, I put greater than. And so then it may be that I'm looping infinitely instead of a, a certain number of times. But it, in terms of a general way of checking, there's no way. But so it's really just your intuition and just seeing. Uh, Maybe this is running a lot longer than it's supposed to. Like my program at home. Uh, could you tell that my program is going to stop within the next day, or is it in an infinite loop? How could you tell? Right? There is, in fact, no way to actually tell. So uh, I can guarantee it will stop. But it's just being able to understand what's going on behind the scenes is actually really important. So like here. Um, if I was doing the assignment and I'm fixing, uh, oops. So if I had a loop out here that said for int n equals five to, uh, uh, let's see, and then something like this. So this loop doesn't actually stop, right? So uh, could I guarantee that this program stops? Well, if there's a a counterexample, then obviously, yes, it will stop. But it's just, can you prove that there is a counterexample? If, if there is no counterexample, this will never stop. So <laughs> it's just being able to think about how does it actually work behind the scenes that you can guarantee or not that it'll actually stop. Other questions? Yeah. Or not. OK. OK, any other questions about assignment four? Cool. So let's go over the quiz unless someone has a quiz to turn in. OK, so let's go over the quiz. So it's mainly question one you want to see. Question two, I'll show the solution, but you're not uh, required at all to know how it works. You better be very, very quick. Five, four, three. OK. So. Uh, no one else can turn this quiz in now because I'm showing the solution. So the way that uh, composite works is we're going to keep a count of how many composites we've seen and then uh, uh, update the candidate uh, composite number every single time by one. Um, and then we'll just keep a count of how many we've seen. And then once the loop says, yeah, you've seen more than, uh, uh, actually, this should be less than. Uh, my bad. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a bug in the slides. I'll fix on on this. I'll fix it. So what we do here is uh, here what we're doing is essentially a uh, a prime checker but altered slightly. So here we just loop over all possible possible divisors of this candidate. If any of them cleanly divide it, then is candidate prime. No. So is it composite then? Yes. So then if this is true, then we found a composite number, and then we break out of this loop because there's no need to check all the other divisors. We've already determined it's a composite number. So then what we, what we do is we just keep increasing the candidate over and over and over. And then once we finally have seen n of them, then we will print out the candidate, uh, the resulting candidate at the very end. OK? Any questions on how that works at a high level? Yeah. Could while be a for loop? Yeah, 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 yeah. As I said, there are gazillions of ways of approaching. For loops are perfectly fine. Yep. Because for loops and while loops are equivalent anyway. So yeah, you can always use a for loop. Other questions? Yeah. Why is your candidate? To three? 
You mean here or what? Yeah, so because the first uh, composite number is 4, there's no reason to check uh, 1, 2, or 3 for that reason. So what I do is I set it to 3, and then the first uh, part of the for loop is I increase it to 4. So it's a way of starting off this first time correctly by setting it to 4, yeah. Why can't you just say it plus 1? Why It doesn't have to. As I said, there are gazillions of ways of approaching it. I could say plus equals one here. There's, there's no problem with that. Yeah, to add one to candidate, yeah. It, or candidate equals candidate plus one. Either one, any one of those approaches is perfectly fine. The, this is not the only high level approach either. There are other ways that you can approach it as well. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the solution to do this. Uh, I do see multiple solutions and I understand how they work. So. Uh, if it's a valid solution, that's fine. I don't care if it's this solution or any other one, as long as it's correct, obviously. Yeah. Sure. How do you prevent getting By sending it to long. Uh, are, are you sure you're doing up to 1,000 to the 5? You shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he said he's using long, though. Uh, try long, long. Oh, okay. Uh, although you're using a max, so... Hmm. Uh, try double. It, it, it won't be exact, but it's... Uh, and then you can verify later yourself. But uh, double should definitely be OK. But uh, I tried long on, on my uh, Macs, and uh, they always work. So long should work. But if it happens to not, uh, just use double. So you have to think about like what data types are appropriate for the situation you're in. But any questions about this? Question one. OK. Question two, uh, if you wrote literally anything on question two, you get full points. So, yeah. Uh, this one is actually pretty simple. Um, I did show how to access characters of a string, but it was more of an offhand comment, and it's not the slides. So uh, that's why it full points to only be fair to everyone. But the way to do it, or one way to do it, is to loop over all possible indices. So look at the first character, and then just uh, inch your way over. Then. Uh, so the valid indices, remember, they start at zero. Uh, we, uh, I showed you this method called length on the string, which gives you the number of characters in the string. So if the, char the first character is index zero, the last character as index length minus one, because it starts at zero. Because length gives you the number of characters in the entire thing. So I loop from zero to length minus one and add one every time. Then I just have this handy method right here. Uh, if it's not a valid at any point, then I just return false immediately. And then otherwise, at the very end, if I've looked through every one and none of them have ever said false, I return true. And then the isVal function just says, uh, it just does a brute force through all possible characters. Capital lowercase, capital lowercase of all six vowels here. Any questions on how this works? Uh, I'll post this today, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I could just put um, this giant block in the if statement right here. Yeah, uh, there are, are many, many ways, as I said, of approaching the exact same problem. Yeah, uh, so th there, that's one way. You could, for instance, make in, in the for loop a uh, new character and set it to be equal to two lower of the corresponding character and then just check all the lowercase versions. That works perfectly well as well. So again, there are multiple ways of approaching the same problem. Any other questions? Yeah, so I'll, I'll post this uh, today. OK, so let's get back into material stuff. So we were starting the stuff on objects last time. So the way we want objects to behave is to make our lives easier by hiding unnecessary details in this thing called an abstract data type or object in general. 
uh, hiding all the unnecessary details to use this object in our head. And then we just access it via uh, the only required interfaces to, see, to introspect into this object. I don't need to know the low level details. I just need to know uh, what things do I need to provide to this object and what things will it give back to me. So we've seen several uh, examples like the PAL function. Do you know how the PAL function works? I don't know how the PAL function works. So uh, that's essentially the same thing. It's not an object, but the, the reasoning is the same. We only provide what is needed to the function, and it gives back the result that we want. I don't care how it works on the back end of PAL. So we saw several types of programming. The procedural version is what we have been working with so far, but now we're going to dive into object-oriented programming, which is working with these object types. So an object is just, it holds a bunch of data and functions to work with that data. Uh, for example, the string uh, or int or double, uh, those can be viewed as objects as well. Because, uh, for example, for string, if you call dot length on the string, then that's a function on the internal data of string, whatever it is, and it gives me back the information that I want, the length of the string. Um, uh, attributes are the data inside the object. The functions are called member functions or methods. Uh, and data hiding and encapsulation is the philosophy that we're going to hide the, uh, the data from the user so that they only access it, the data in some sense from these functions. They don't access the data directly. Because if they access the data directly, now we're basically back to where we started. We're not thinking at a more high level than we were before. So an example of an object would be, for example, a square. Because, uh, not because, the only things that we need to know about the square are the, is the side, right? So the member variable here, or the data inside this object, is the only thing we need is side. So we keep that, as a, uh, we keep that hidden from the user, and we expose these two functions to the user. Uh, we expose them and say, yeah, you can set the side of this square, or you can get the side of the square. But in some situations, you may not want to have a get whatever method or a set whatever method, like a bank account. You don't necessarily want to have a function which says set bank account balance because then I can just uh, add whatever I want to my bank account. But is it okay if I get the balance from my account? Yeah, because I'm not a, this does not change the value of my bank account. It just gets the current value, whatever it is. So the reason we, why we want to hide data is to uh, make our lives easier by not having to think about it, but also protection in the case of bank accounts and whatnot. So the way that we're going to create objects is something called a class. So like string, we can make our own classes. So the way we make a class is, is uh, kind of like an if statement, but without parentheses and the semicolon at the end. But uh, essentially what we have here is class and whatever name of the class we want with curly braces and then stuff goes in the inside and we'll see what actually goes on the inside. Okay? So, um, so here, uh, for a class, we want to hide the data from the user, but we want to expose the functions that work on the data, like the get side and set side methods, right? So we need to be able to distinguish what data we want to hide, potentially all of it, or what functions we want to expose to the user. Maybe all of them, maybe some of them I don't want to expose to the user, uh, that sort of thing. So. These two access specifiers, there's actually another one, but we haven't seen that yet. So the two main ones we'll see are called public and private. So as you might expect, public is when we want to expose the certain thing to the user, and private is when we don't. So for a class, the default is private. So if I don't set uh, anything to be public, everything is private by default. So here's an example. 
And then I saw some hands go up, so we'll, I'll ask those after. So here, uh, what happens is I say private right here, and from the word private down until I see the word public, everything is private. So, oops. So if I have something else right here, like another function or some variable right there, that will also be private. So as long as I am in the private part, uh, until I get to the public uh, section, then uh, all of those will be private. So in this case, there's only one thing uh, which is private, which is side. And then when I, when I declare public right here, then everything from public until either the end or when I see private back again, uh, those are all exposed to the user. So uh, public here means uh, if I uh, declare a square object, like a string object, but I declare a square object, I can say whatever the name of that variable is, you can say dot get side. Like you can call dot length on a string, you can call got, uh, dot get side to get the side length of the string. Or I can say the name of the variable dot set side and pass in the side there. So we declare them exactly the same way as we do with everything else we've done so far. It's just now we have to uh, make it the same type as we called it in the class. So then we can call dot set side and then get side we can do exactly as we might expect. Let's see. Okay, so let's actually do an example of this. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, I, I mean, I love in and out but uh, 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 I love it so much that I want to make this program even better. So note here that uh, for all of this uh, code over here, I had to make it global, or uh, I didn't have to, but it's just uh, easier for the main function if it was global. But here, uh, I had to make all of these variables unnecessarily. Um, I had to make all these auto variables, and so that was uh, kind of a pain. Maybe we can package all of this data into an object and then put appropriate methods as we need to. So uh, I have up here a comment that says, let's make a class for a menu item. And then we can think about what kinds of data are we, uh, do we need in this uh, uh, menu item class. So I'm not gonna do the entire thing because there are some things that we haven't gotten to later in the slides, but I'm just gonna show you the main idea. So how do I make a class again? Uh, put the word class and then the name of the thing that we want to uh, make. So the convention in C++, you don't have to do this, but the convention is to use all lowercase for the class name. You don't have to, and in this case, I'm not going to, uh, to fit the slides better. So I'm going to call it menu item like this. Okay, so great. Now we just made our first type. So can I... For instance, can I make a menu item like this directly? Like that? Can I do that? So, uh, uh, am I allowed to do this is what, all I'm saying. Yeah, uh, I don't see any compiler warning or error. So, uh, I could possibly have an empty class. In some situations, that is a good thing to do. But now we have to think... Uh, we don't really want this to have no behavior whatsoever. We want to put data inside of it. So we want to put data in, inside of it. So what access specifier do, should we have on it? Uh, private or public for data? It's not a rhetorical question. Private, because we want to hide the data from the user. Okay, so let's see. So we have private here. Uh, nicely outdented it for me. Um, so what things do we want to have on a menu item? Like, what are the properties of a menu item that you want to have? Oh, sorry? The, the, the price of the item. Good. So what would the appropriate type of such an item be? Uh, double, right? Because the price could either be an integer or have fractional parts in the... And we can actually see that from the prices here. So... Uh, I'm going to make a double price. 
So here I can call price whatever I like, but the, uh, I need to specify a type here. Okay, and I could, for example, set this to be some value, and so this will be the default value if it's not, over, uh, not changed by some other method. Okay, uh, but there's no reason to set that here. But what else might I want on a menu item? Or what are the properties of a menu item? The, the name of the thing. And what would a, an appropriate type for that be? String. So let's put a string name here. Good. Is there anything else we might want? I think that's pretty good. Uh, there's not really anything that you may... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, this is not public because I put the private specifier here. And even if I didn't... Right. The thing is, I don't want to expose the raw data to the user. I don't want to have them be able to change the name uh, without allowing me to do so. And so we have these getter and setter methods that allow us to get the value from there if we allow it to be, or we can set the value if we allow it to be. Here, should we change the, be allowed to change the price of the name? No, should I, should I have a set name or a set price function? No, but if I made it public, then they're allowed to change it. Yeah. Uh, technically, there is a way to get around private, but uh, not for what we need to know. So just think private is not exposed to the user uh, without allowing us to do like a public getter function, for example, or a setter function. Uh, th there are ways to get around it, though. Yeah. No, uh, correct, right. I don't have to write the word private here because in a class, everything is uh, private by default. You're absolutely right. But it's better to be pedantic here because there's an equivalent version of a class that we'll see called the struct where everything is public by default. So being pedantic here is always a good thing. Yeah. I don't know what the question is, sorry. Um, but it's on... Yeah, what they order is public in a sense in that it's in the main function. But the thing is, uh, we're going to be passing their data about, say, how much they ordered, how many, uh, the number of items that they ordered to this menu item class. And it's going to do the computation for me. The main function is not going to do any of that computation. So now it's handling it on the back end and the user's not responsible for that. So it's hiding all of the work away from the user. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. And in fact, I can do this as many times as I like. So I can have a public here and a private back and then public here. So I can, I can keep going back and forth as many times as I like. Depending, so usually you put the private stuff first and then the public, but you can put this in any order. As long as you put the specifier, and then everything from here to the next thing is that access specifier. So everything that I write here will be public. Any other questions? OK, great. So oh yeah, so let's actually do the, uh, the getter functions. Should I have a, a set function here? No. So. Uh, you may wonder then, how do we actually set the price inside the thing? There's, there's a way to do that, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So the public here is, well, we want to get the price or get the name. So uh, is there a way to do this directly? Um, I think, yeah. So in uh, C Lion, there's actually, instead of having you write the getter and setter functions directly, there's a way to actually uh, generate them for you. So if you control click on the class name and go to generate, then you can actually uh, generate the getters or setters or both if you need them. So if you generate the getters, uh, then I'm going to select both of these. 
and then put them there. So it immediately generates everything that we need to. So uh, you maybe wonder about this const at the end. There's actually a good reason why that's there, but uh, and a reason why there's an ampersand here, but we're going to actually get rid of it here. So, but, uh, so there's a good reason for why it did all that stuff, but this essentially just, and a const here, actually, but this actually does exactly what we want. Um, we have a public function, note is in the public section, which says, uh, if you call menu item dot get price, it'll return the internal variable for you, right? So only through this access path can you get to that internal variable. You can't set it because I didn't make a setter for it. Um, and this is the only way to get it. So if we wanted to work with this thing, for example, um, let's see. So if we have a menu item M right here, then we can see out, for example, M dot get name like this. So then when this program runs, it'll print the uh, it'll be empty string, but it'll print the name of this menu item, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um. Well, what is that in that sense? Mm -hmm. well, well, this is only one menu item. So I have to declare a menu item for each of the items in the menu. So it's, it's not the entire menu here. That's a different problem. This is just a single menu item. So if I want to do stuff with a secret menu, then I have to make a menu item for there, all those uh, things. So all we're doing is we're hiding the work away from the user. We're not really doing anything about like secret menu or things like that. We're just hiding all of the internal data from the user. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to declare all of those. Yeah. So in effect, it's not really doing much work, uh, much less work. But now um, uh, we don't have to worry about forwarding it off to this handle item uh, function. OK. But uh, you may wonder, well, OK, this is fine and all. But uh, if I want to make a menu item for, say, the cheeseburger item, uh, I don't see here any way of setting the price, right? I need to set the price at some point, right? Uh, and I can't just say, well, I'm going to set the price to be 3.6 or whatever the price is here. Because if I'm going to make a menu item for a different menu item, then I'm going to have to change this. But I can only have one declaration of this class menu item. I could make a menu item for each of the items on the menu, but that would defeat the philosophy of using a class to be able to handle all of this work simultaneously. So uh, let's uh, continue on, and then we'll get to that thing. So member functions. The two that we are using are called accessor and mutator functions, AKA the same name as getter and setter functions. Um, yeah, so all of this is pretty much what we just did. Uh, so, oh yeah, so, okay. So an inline function is where the, the, what the function does is inside the class. So here, uh, like for the square example, the declaration and the implementation of the function are directly in the class. Um, and there are some benefits of doing that, some uh, not so good things about it. But if you want to declare it outside of the class, there's a way to do it. So uh, using this colon colon uh, thing. So if I want to clean up my code and say, I'm not going to put get price inside of the class, I'm going to put it outside. So I'm going to move it outside. And then I want to say, well, uh, it says an error here because it doesn't know what the price thing is. Because I didn't say it belongs to the menu item class. So in order to say that, I copy the class name down and put colon colon. And then there's, OK, yeah. So now it says it does not match any declaration in menu item. So if I'm going to put a 
function outside the class like this, I need to declare that it, it actually exists in the class. Yeah. No, the, the order of public and private doesn't matter inside the class. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like when we had the example of functions calling other functions, we had to make this thing called a, starts with a proto and ends with type. We need to make a prototype. So here we're going to make a prototype. Get price like this, and then this error will go away. Okay. So I'm declaring in the class, hey, this function exists, but the implementation of it is not right here. So then the compiler says, oh, the implementation of it is right here. Okay. Any questions about how this works? Okay, hopefully, uh, okay, I guess we're not going to get to that today. But uh, yeah, so the reason why we're doing this is that when we're going to make classes, it, the convention is to put all of the, the class-related stuff right into one file and put all of the external implementation stuff like we just did with get price in a different file. So it's what's called a header file and an implementation file. So when you're, in, you're including, say, IOStream, you're getting all of the stuff in the header file, which means the class related material, the stuff related to the class, and all of the implementation stuff of that class usually is in a different file. So yeah, so member var variables are private usually. Sometimes you want them public. Um, uh, yeah, so it, the functions for accessing something and mutating something are usually public. Uh, a word of warning, well not warning, but uh, of advice, is that within the class, you can actually access the private uh, variables. So you don't have to say, well, the private stuff you can never access anywhere you can access it within the class. So if I wanted to say like, uh, see out the name right here, uh, I'm accessing the private variable directly. So that's totally fine, it's in the same class, but uh, I can't access it outside of the class. But you say, well, this is outside the class right here. But I'm saying that it's within the class because I have the class name with the, that operator right there, saying this function is in the class of menu item. Okay. Yeah, so, it, so some advice about like the names of the functions. I don't have to call it get price and I don't have to call it uh, get name or whatever, but it's just a convention. Okay. Um, yeah, there's some uh, trade-offs here. Um, if you put everything into the class, uh, the class itself instead of having it outside, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just it may clutter up your class. That's all it really is. And then the uh, disadvantage of putting it outside the class is that if you want to know how this function works, now you have to go over to outside the class. OK, so this is what I wanted to get to. So uh, a constructor, so this is the last thing we'll get to today because I only have a minute and a half. But a constructor is basically a special function which handles setting up the, the object when you declare the object. So for example, when I declare a string, then on the back end, it's setting up all of the variables accordingly, depending on uh, what parameters I happen to pass. So uh, for example, uh, if we wanted one for square, I need to be able to set the side at the very beginning by saying uh, the side of this square is 5. So here, what you do is, in the public part, because I want to access it outside of the class, I'm going to put this uh, thing called a constructor, and then uh, we can set things accordingly in there. So for our purposes here, for menu item, uh, we're going to do uh, something like this. So here what we're going to do is we're going to pass the two variables that we need. So we're going to pass string name and uh, double price. Actually, I'm going to call it different. Uh, N1 and P1. And then we're going to say 
uh, name is equal to N1 and then price is equal to P1. So when I make a menu item and pass these two data in, then the internal variables will be initialized. And then that solves the problem we had before. Any other questions? Great, I'll see you Monday.